All right, so I'm gonna talk about FFmpeg uh, and specifically how to use it to decode video on iOS and Android platforms. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm fairly new to the VidTech scene. Uh, my background is more in web development and web operations. I was an early employee at GitHub. Uh, I spent a lot of time on the Ruby core team uh, doing performance fixes and GC improvements. Uh, but over the past couple of years, my interests have shifted over to uh, multimedia. Uh, last year, I became a FFmpeg committer, and I currently am the founder of a, a, a small startup. We have an app uh, that runs on uh, all, all the major streaming platforms, Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV, and it allows people to do sort of like a do-it-yourself live TV DVR uh, using a network-enabled tuner in their home. So before we get started, I just want to get a quick sense of how many people in here use FFmpeg, and specifically the CLI. OK, so that's probably almost half the room. Uh, and the other FFmpeg developers and I will be around to collect our royalties later. <laughs> uh, so how about using FFmpeg but the libraries themselves? So this would be writing an application that links with uh, libav codec, libav format. So a little bit less, I would say probably about 25%. And then how many of you have contributed to FFmpeg? Uh, and so that's even smaller, maybe 8%. I don't know, I'm just guessing here. Uh, so let me just give you a quick overview. I mean, FFmpeg has a lot of libraries. The two that I'm going to cover uh, in a little bit of detail are libav format, libav codec. So libav format uh, does two major things. One, it has muxers and demuxers, right? And so this uh, decodes formats, takes a data stream, and converts it into AV packet, which is one of the major structures in FFmpeg. Um, so these are formats like HLS, Dash, MPEG TS, et cetera, et cetera. Then it also, for some strange reason, probably legacy reasons, contains protocol implementations. So this includes stuff like HTTP, TCP, UDP, uh, stuff like that. That's also part of libav format. On the other side is libav codec, and here's where all the codec implementations exist. So stuff like MPEG-2, H.264, HVC, and all the newer ones like v VP9, VPX, et cetera. So uh, there's two sides, there's the encoders and decoders. Uh, one of the major uh, structures that you use in libav codec is an AV frame, which represents one video frame. And so when you're encoding, you take your frames and turn them into packets uh, of just data. And when you're decoding, you take those packets and convert them into frames. Uh, and there's a little bit of a distinction about uh, there's decoders and hardware accelerators that are both inside libav codec, and they both have a similar goal, they decode video. Uh, what decoders are sort of standalone decoders. So for example, FFmpeg has a H.264 decoder that it comes bundled with. That's a software decoder. Um, and it also has hardware accelerators. So the way hardware accelerators work is you use the regular H.264 decoder, for instance, but at certain points, instead of actually doing the decoding, it calls into a hardware accelerator. Uh, and the big thing to keep in mind about, about these two APIs that are available for writing decoders is decoders can be asynchronous, whereas hardware accelerators, because of legacy reasons, the APIs are all synchronous. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. So first, I want to talk about iOS. iOS has a system API that is available on iOS, tvOS, and macOS called Video Toolbox that basically exposes the hardware decoder capabilities of those devices. So. Uh, before we jump into the video toolbox, just to give you an overview of how you would do software decoding with libav codec, uh, you would first create a codec, uh, or find the decoder rather, and you would say basically, give me the H.264 decoder, uh, and then you would instantiate the, an instance of that decoder, so that's AV codec context, and that's sort of like a main uh, structure that you create and interact with anytime you're doing any sort of decoding. And then basically you open that codec, start feeding data in. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but this is just a general idea of how you create a codec. Now, if you're doing the same thing with Video Toolbox, say you have some code already for FFmpeg, you want to run an iOS device, and now you want to take advantage of the hardware decoding, you can see the structure looks very similar, but there's a little bit of new code. So first thing you do is on that same H.264 codec instance that you created, you attach a hardware device context. And you're basically creating a device context of the type video toolbox and just attaching it. And then you request a pixel format. So uh, pixel formats basically specify for an AV frame what kind of, what is the memory layout of that data? How is the frame stored? And in this case, we're saying 
hey, uh, I know I'm just using the normal H.264 decoder, but I want you to give me back frames that are in the pixel format of video toolbox. So you've created a codec, you're feeding data in. Now let's talk about what the, uh, the frames that are coming out look like. So on the left, again, this is if you're just doing software decoding, right? Uh, you call AV codec receive frame on your instance, you get back a frame, and you'll notice that the image format on that is sort of like a regular software format, in this case, of YUV420P. If you do the same thing on that video toolbox instance we created, now you're getting back frames in that specialized video toolbox format. And what you'll notice is that on the left is, is a very generic one, and on the right is something that's platform specific, right? So you can only get back these video toolbox pixel format frames if you're running on an iOS device, tvOS device, macOS device. And what this video toolbox specialized pixel format basically means is that instead of, uh, as you could do with a software frame of just reach into the memory and like read out a row, read out uh, the pixel data, it's actually not readily available pixel data anymore. It's a wrapper around a very platform specific structure, in this case, a CV pixel buffer. So that's you know, what Apple came up with and that's what represents a frame, a pixel buffer on those devices and you don't necessarily know what the memory that's behind those is. It might be GPU memory, it might be, you know, whatever they need to do to make it hardware enabled. But the nice thing is now that you have this very specific iOS structure, you can use iOS functionality on it. So for instance, you could render this straight to the screen, you could convert it to a UI image, render it. You could access the underlying pixel data that might actually be living on the GPU, read it, change it, et cetera. So for instance, like if you did want to read out the data, there's a bunch of functions that let you iterate over each plane, access the underlying data. You can lock it, modify it if you want as well. Uh, you can use another set of functions to transfer these into OpenGL textures. And so similarly, if you want to do a rendering pipeline using OpenGL, if you want to write a GL shader that does some, some sort of transformation of that frame, you can now easily convert it into a GL texture and work with it that way. And then you can also always use FFmpeg to convert it back into a normal sort of software frame. Uh, and so in this case, say you wanted to use something in libav filter to do scaling, to crop black bars, to do deinterlacing, and you want to reuse a lot of that code, you could simply convert it back and you would be copying back the memory contents from maybe the GPU back into software land and then just using it as normal. So that's sort of an idea of how it works on iOS. And you can, as you can see, it's, it's fairly similar. You just do a couple things, and now all of a sudden you're getting back these very specific platform-specific frames. Uh, now let's look at Android. So on Android, there is a uh, library called Media Codec. That is the way that things work on Android if you want to use the hardware decoding APIs. These are generally Java-based APIs. You can use them to JNI. And then if you're on newer Android versions, there are NDK equivalents as well. So going back again to the software side, uh, just for comparison, like we saw before, if you now compare it to on the right, uh, what you have to do with Media Codec, you can see there's a little bit more involved. So the first thing you have to do is you have to pass in your Java VM context, because all of these APIs, uh, at least as implemented still in FFmpeg, are GNI based. So you have to pass in you know, your Android apps Java context into FFmpeg so that it can then introspect, pull out those APIs and call them. Um, the codec is different, so we're not using the software codec anymore. We're using a very specialized, it's implemented not as a hardware accelerator, but as a different codec. And the first thing you'll notice is you're still getting back generic frames. And that's just because of the way that the system APIs are implemented. Um, they're based, they're very specialized, and by default, we just copy the frames back and give them to you. But there is a different way to do it. And again, uh, similar to how you do a video toolbox, what you do in this case is you have to pass in the surface view. So in your Android app, you create a surface view, it's backed by a surface, and if you take that surface and pass it into FFmpeg, now instead of converting those frames back into software frames, it can give you that pixel format media codec, which is again a platform specific wrapper. And what you can do with this wrapper is again unwrap it to access the underlying media codec frame, and then you can call certain functions to either drop the frame or render it to the screen. And so this is, again, a zero copy rendering pipeline where you can use FFmpeg to do the hardware decoding and then decide when you want to render it. So that's sort of like a very high level overview. 
of what the state of things is. On the iOS side, we're looking pretty well. Like I mentioned, it's hardware accelerated, which means underlying APIs. We're still using the synchronous video toolbox APIs. Uh, there's some work in progress to try to do an async decoder. We also have full support for audio decoding and encoding, as well as video encoding. On the Android side, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, there, a lot of these are work in progress, uh, but the point of me getting up here is that I, I am currently maintaining both the Video Toolbox and Media Codec implementations in FFmpeg with a lot of other people as well. But I would love to see more of people in the community start using these, giving us feedback, contributing patches. So if you have any interest in improving FFmpeg, video decoding, and or encoding on these mobile platforms, find me after this talk, and I'd, be love, I'd love to chat. Thank you.